All right, so today we're uh, continuing on our tour through Gaussian beams. And today we're going to talk about what happens when you pass a Gaussian beam through a lens. And the answer is you get a Gaussian beam with different parameters. And uh, I will prove some things and sort of leave, leave some things as uh, math mathematically, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll motivate them, but I won't completely prove everything. But let me just remind you uh, of what, what Gaussian beams are and, and where, uh, you know, where, where we're going here. So the electric field for a Gaussian beam, we break it up into the positive and negative frequency components uh, because we like working with these complex, complex beams. Oftentimes it's easier to deal with the math of complex numbers rather than trig identities. And uh, oops, e, e plus, the positive frequency piece, which gets multiplied by e to the minus i omega t, but we're not going to write that. Um, this is some constant e naught plus for a Gaussian beam. W naught, the size of the, the radius of the waste at the center over W of z. And let me draw a picture here to remind you what's, what's going on. Um, there's some Gaussian beam. It tends to have a focus somewhere. You know, this is either the center of the laser cavity, or maybe it's the, the output of the laser cavity, depending on how the mirrors and lenses are arranged. And this distance here is W do not, and as a function of z, some distance down, down the way is w of z. And it's like a, more like a radius than a diameter of a beam. And we'll see what this really means. This is a, this gets multiplied by e to the minus r squared over w of z squared. And so this w of z is like a standard deviation of a Gaussian, sort of the characteristic length over which things fall off by one over E. And then this gets multiplied by a whole series of phase factors. Let me just keep this inside of the same exponent. So this is, this is the amplitude stuff so far, and now comes a bunch of phase factors. So plus I, K, Z. So there's every, um, every wavelength, you get a, a phase change of two pi in the Z direction with some small corrections, minus I inverse tangent of z over z naught plus i k, hopefully I don't run out of room here, r squared over two, r squared over two capital R as a function of z. And uh, I'm getting close to the edge, but I can close the, the brackets. All right, so um, let me remind you of some terms here. So, um, k, which is just the, it's called the wave number, is 2 pi over lambda. That way, kz, every time z goes up by a factor of lambda, this phase goes by a factor of 2 pi. Um, and there's a bunch of definitions of, of some constants here, which we'll, we'll continue to use. So z naught is, uh, I think the easiest way to define it is a half k w naught squared. This can also be written as pi w naught squared over lambda. Um, w of z. Well, this is going to be w naught when z equals 0 and something else uh, at other places. This is w naught times the square root of 1 plus z over z naught all squared. And r of z, let me write that up here. R of z, similar expression, z times one plus, in this case, it's z naught over z all squared and no square root. All right, so you know every every term here is defined, and and the uh, the one parameter. Well, okay, there's there's the wavelength, of course, but we're working. You know, for, for the first half of this class, we're basically just saying, well, let's let's just consider light at one particular wavelength. That's a pretty good approximation for lasers. So the wavelength is kind of fixed. We're just picking a wavelength. And then there's two, two parameters. One is where is the center of the beam? And the other is what is the, the waste of the beam at that, at that focus? Once you specify those two parameters, 
once you've picked your origin and you've picked your beam size, everything else follows from uh, from that you know, and, and, and the wavelength. So um, the entire shape of this beam is, is fixed. And, and remember that this solves Maxwell's equations in the approximation that the envelope here changes slowly in the z direction. So if you try to focus this too tightly, uh, the approximation begins to break down. But as long as w naught is bigger than a wavelength or two, uh, which it certainly is for real lasers, the spot sizes coming out of real lasers are you know sort of millimeter size, not mic micrometer size. Uh, this should be good. Once you start really trying to focus down to get the absolute smallest possible spot size, then you have to worry a little bit about breaking this approximation. Although even that is uh, is not uh, uh, it, the approximation remains good even when w naught is is really you know quite quite small and a really tight focus. Um, okay, so so those are our parameters. Now there's a mathematical trick which was in the in the section, there's the last problem in the section to, to prove that this, this is true, but I'm just gonna state it, which is that if you define this complex number called Q, so if we just define Q to be, uh, where do I wanna define Q? I wanna keep it, so let me just erase, erase the title. So if we define this complex number Q to be the following combination, uh, Z minus I Z naught, no, no, it's plus or minus, Z minus I Z naught. So Z remember is just the Z coordinate. So Q, Q contains uh, information about where you are and it also contains information about Z naught, which is, once you specified the wavelength is just related to this, this beam waste. It just happens to be easier to work in terms of Z naught. Remember, what is Z naught? Let me draw the picture again up here. Z naught is sort of about the Z where you transition. Well, you can see it from these formulas. It's about the Z where you transition from being roughly constant. So when Z is really tiny, one plus something tiny is roughly constant to when, when Z is really big, much bigger than Z naught, um, this waste grows linearly. So Z naught is sort of a characteristic size here where you're transitioning from a roughly constant shape to a roughly constant angle. And uh, this, this is defined in this particular way uh, because it, it plays into a, a lot of the, the parameters. But uh, when, when it's combined with Q in this way, there's a nice mathematical trick where you can write this E plus in terms of Q and things look really, really quite simple. So E, E naught plus, you can write this as Q naught, which are, you're just substituting in Z equals zero over Q of Z times exp, exp, E to the two things now, I K R squared over two Q of Z plus I K Z. So it looks like these are both phases, but remember Q is a complex number. So uh, this, this first term isn't actually just a pure phase. It includes all of the, all of the terms in here that are not I K Z. And that, that might be a little bit surprising. It, in, it includes this Gaussian profile. It includes this, uh, uh, sort of radial phase factors. It also includes this arc tangent. And the arc tangent actually comes from this, this term out here. If you imagine, so, so Q naught is just minus I Z naught over Q, which depends on Z. And that, that ratio of complex numbers, you can write as the magnitude in the phase. And if you, if you write it that way, the phase becomes, uh, phase becomes the arc tangent of the denominator over the numerator. And that's, that's what ends up becoming this arc tangent here. 
so each of these pieces is, is accounted for if you if you do the complex number algebra properly. But this is a much simpler, simpler sort of more compact way of writing it. And this would be a cube mathematical curiosity. Uh, but what's nice is that Q transforms really nicely with lenses and mirrors and and other optics. So let me let me remind you of all the the matrix optics from when we did the the lenses. Even though we're doing waves, a lot of that same matrix stuff applies here. So let me switch, switch markers again. So remember we had matrices that were in the form A, B, C, D. And I'll give you some examples. Matrix for going through free space was just one D zero one. And before we, we said that these matrices acted on vectors that were of the form y, the distance above the origin, and theta, the angle that, that a beam was taking. So if this is your optical axis and this is your beam, there's some y, some y, and some theta here. And these matrices acted on that. Uh, M lens was one, zero, minus one over F one. So you can see that propagating through free space with all these ones and zeros here, it only ends up changing the Y coordinate and the lens with all these ones and zeros in this position ends up keeping the Y coordinate the same when you do the matrix multiply, but it ends up changing the theta. So, so when beams propagate through free space, they can change their, their distance away from the origin. When they go through a lens, right at the location of the lens, they're not instantly moving up or down. They're just changing, changing angles. And, and what's, what's interesting is that the way Q transforms, I'll write it up here because I'm going to keep it and use it a couple of times. The way Q transforms under, under, this, uh, under these operations is, is related to how uh, these rays transform. So you start off with some Q1 right before one of these operations, right before a lens or right before propagating through free space or any of the others that, uh, that we could talk about, um, you get a Q2 out of it by taking A Q1 plus B over C Q1 plus D. And uh, this, this allows you to um, to work out what the new Q is. And then once you have the new Q, you can plug it into this, um, this formula for the, the electric field. And you know, by doing the complex algebra properly, you can you could either back out this, or you can just take whatever you get and explicitly split it up to the real imaginary parts and start start reapplying, um, start reapplying all, all of the, the definitions here. All right, so I'm I'm never going to prove that this actually works. I, I think this proof is uh, I I've never seen a great a great version of this proof. I've only seen quite quite complicated versions, but we can verify that it works for these simple cases. And since really all we're going to do in this class is propagate through free space or go through lenses, uh, that that will be good enough for us. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so so let's let's check let's check this free space um, free space example. So I'm going to erase all my my e pluses here, while uh, to give myself room to check that free space propagation example. And the reason why this approximation works, or sorry, the reason why this works is that uh, beams. Gaussian beams act a lot like these paraxial rays that where uh, where these matrices worked before for rays. As long as as long as the beam stays relatively close to the axis, as long as those spreading angles don't get to be, you know, close to a radian, as long as they're you know less than less than a few degrees, um, everything is staying very close to the axis. And the first order approximations of uh, of propagation work out quite nicely. And uh, it's the same, same approximation is required to get the, these matrices to work with rays as, as uh, to get 
these matrices to work with the, the Gaussian beams in this way. So, so let's check let's check this free space example. So let me let uh, so check check M free. So let me let uh, let Q1 equal some Z1 minus I Z naught. And remember Z naught is just a lambda here. Z naught is related to the waste and the wavelength. Um, and uh, propagating through free space shouldn't change the waste, right? If you just move further, further away in Z, it shouldn't change the waste. So uh, that's why I'm not calling this Z, Z naught one or something. Uh, but let's just let's verify that that is in fact the case. So so Q two, Q two is going to be all right. A Q one A is just one. So Q one plus B. B is this element D plus D over C Q one. So zero plus one. So this is just uh, it's quite simple here. This is Z one plus D is now the new real part minus I Z naught. So if you've propagated through a distance D and you can imagine resetting your origin to be the new, uh, the new D, uh, the, the new Z coordinate Z2 Is just a shifted version of the old z coordinate z1, because this matrix has just basically shifted everything over. And it is true that, in in fact, you know, in, with the free propagation here, the z naught, the characteristic uh, uh, length over which things transition from flat to to angle, stays the same. And and since z naught stays the same, the the beam waste also stays the same. This is pretty much what you'd expect. The more complicated and interesting situation is going through the lens, and let me uh, let me work out what that what that looks like, and then we'll we'll spend a little bit of time talking about it, and then that will that will be the end of the class, and the end of our discussion on pure Gaussian beams with no no uh, cavities or anything. So let me see. Um, I want to keep almost everything that's up, so that's going to be annoying. I will uh, I'll erase my my check of free space in a second. But let me just write roughly what's going to happen. So you can imagine that Gaussian beam is going to come in, but rather than let it come back out again, I'm going to put a lens here, a thin lens. And what's going to happen is this is a converging lens. So this, this was converging and now it's going to converge even more. So you can imagine that this looks something like this and then it's going to, it's going to spread out. So if you have a, a Gaussian beam that's Maybe this is exaggerated. I just have uh, had a beam that's much more collimated. So its spreading angle is quite low. And you focus it, this seems intuitive that you'll you'll have the beam come come to a, a smaller spot size. And this is always true in optics. When when you try to confine something to a tiny area, it will always end up spreading out more. Uh, that's, that's just a property of, of any kind of wave equation. That's true in quantum mechanics too. The tighter you can find something, the more the wave function spreads out in optics, the tighter you can find some, some beam or some image, the more things are going to spread out as time goes on. All right, so uh, yeah, the uh, let's let's draw some some wave fronts here. So so if I were to actually draw the, you know, say the peaks of the wavefront or the places where the phase is zero for, for my E plus, what I get is I get something that looks like this and the wavefronts get more and more curved as I go further and further away, spherically symmetric here. And then here, wavefronts start out curved and in the center they get straight and then they get curved again the other direction as, as I go out. And what happens here at the thin optic? Well, the thin optic, this doesn't change 
doesn't change the waste, doesn't change W. Um, so at, at this particular location, not, I mean, it's gonna change W naught because the old W naught was probably about this size. The new W naught is much smaller, but it doesn't change the waste at this location. I'll say it doesn't change W of Z, but it does change, does change the wavefront curvature. And this was all set by R, R of Z. And unfortunately that's the one I erased. So let me write it up here. So it's gonna change the curvature of the wavefronts. So R of Z is Z one plus Z naught over Z, all of that squared. Okay. So let me erase the free space propagation business and we'll tackle this new, this new situation. So while I'm erasing, let me just say, um, remember we're taking the approximation that this lens is extremely thin. So what actually happens is when this wavefront hits, hits the, the lens, in reality, the center of a converging lens is a little bit thicker. And so the optical path length is, is longer for, uh, for, for the, the light near the center and the optical path length that the, the phase fronts have to go through near the top and the bottom are, are, uh, are shorter, right? This lens is getting physically thinner like a magnifying glass at the ends. And that's, if we worked out the uh, kind of the, the detailed Maxwell's equation business, that's what, that's what leads to this, uh, this change in the wave fronts. The wave fronts don't, don't change instantaneously inside of a real lens i will change smoothly, but in the approximation that the lens is, is really thin, we're just considering the, what the wavefronts look like right before the extremely thin lens and right after the extremely thin lens. So in order to tackle this problem, what we want to do is we want, we want to write, uh, instead of Q, we want to write one over Q. That ends up being a simpler, simpler thing to consider. And you know, this is clearly just one over Z minus I Z naught, if you were, if you were to, uh, uh, what is it called, Rash rationalize the denominator or no, whatever you do for complex numbers, you make the denominator real. You multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate in order to make make it uh, in the standard form, real plus i imaginary. If you were to do that just by algebra and by these definitions here, you get that this is one over r plus that's the real part and the imaginary part is lambda over pi w of z squared. This is just by, by algebra and definitions. So that's uh, you know, a few lines. Um, and we can ask if this is what happens to, to q1 to become q2, we can ask what happens to one over q1 to become one over q2. And again, this is also just by some algebraic manipulations of stuff here. So if you were to go through all this, you get C plus D over Q1 over A plus B over Q2. So given this for any complex number, you could just sort of rearrange it to, to, to get that. And what the, matrix equation for the lens, lens says is that this is C. So we get one, uh, sorry, minus, minus one over F in the numerator plus D, which is one. So plus one times one over Q1, uh, sorry, plus one over Q1 divided by A, which is one plus B times this and B here is, is zero. So this is again, just over one. So I'm not gonna write that. 
But now let me plug in, just from, from this up here, what one over Q1 gives us. So this is the real part now becomes one over R of Z minus one over F plus one over Q1. Uh, but, so let me, sorry, not, not one over Q1. So one over Q1 is one over R of Z. That's the real part and the imaginary part just stays the same. So plus the imaginary part is lambda over pi W of Z squared. All right, so, so when we translate this back into a Q2, what does this say? Well, for any Q, this imaginary term has to do with the wavelength and the waste and the wavelength and the waste shouldn't change. In fact, they, uh, they don't. The waste at this particular location does not change. And the wavelength doesn't change on the other side of the lens. And what has changed in this somewhat simple way is this one over R. So um, this is the old curvature is whatever it is. So if I put the lens over here, this curvature is negative. If I put the lens over here, right at the focus of this, the, the curvature is, is uh, uh, well, let me just, the radius of curvature gets bigger as you go this way, right? Because these, these uh, lines become circles of bigger and bigger curvature. As you, as you transition in, when you're around Z naught, there's some more complicated stuff happening, but right at the focus where, where Z is, is zero, the curvature, uh, the, the radius of curvature blows up. And that's, that's the same as, uh, well, what, what, when a radius of curvature blows up, that's basically these lines becoming straighter and straighter and straighter. The radius that would be required to, to, uh, to draw these straight lines would be infinitely far away. So, so if in this special case where I put this lens right at the focus of the first beam, the radius of curvature is infinite or one over the radius of curvature is zero, put it that way, it's a little bit easier. So for the new, the new beam on this side, this is all Q, Q1 over here. And this, is, this beam over here is described by Q2. So for the special case where I happen to put the lens right at the focus, this term goes away and my new curvature at this point is minus one over F. So, so what does that mean? That means that if I really did put this at the, at the place where the beam is pretty collimated, this first radius here looks like it, it's, it's a curve uh, that looks like it's drawn from, from the, from the focus here. So uh, this, uh, the, the new radius of curvature is, is negative because, so these are positive radius of curvatures and these are negative radius of curvatures. And it looks like it's drawn from, from the focal point. And so for the special case where I'm putting, putting the lens right at the place where uh, the beam looks very collimated and the, the phases are all, the phase fronts are all vertical, uh, it, it will focus at the focus of the lens, which is what you expect. And the way it does it is it changes the radius of curvature of these phase fronts to be converging. And uh, let me, what do I want to say here? So, um, the, I didn't, I didn't plan on talking about this. So I thought I would spend a little bit more time talking about the things I did talk about, but the, uh, the book goes through a lot of algebra to prove, okay, once, once I have my new, my new beam here, uh, I, I know what the new beam looks like. It looks like a, uh, it looks like a beam where there's a waste at this location of the same size as my initial beam and a new radius of curvature that, that then tells me that it's converging. And I can do some algebra and say, if I were to ask as a function of Z, 
what is the smallest spot size here? Uh, I get I get a, a pretty simple expression. So so w w min. Well, uh, yeah, w min is the same as w naught two here. Uh, this is just given by uh, lambda the wavelength f the focal length of this lens over pi w not one. So, what does this say? This says that if you if you have a very uh, a fat beam to start out with that that has a very large focal size, the the bigger the beam you start out with, the smaller you can make the, the beam focused after the lens. And uh, the smaller your wavelength, the smaller you can make the focus size. That, that might make sense. Uh, but the longer your focal length of the lens is, uh, that, that hurts you. So the, in order to make a really small spot, you want a, a lens with a very short focal length f. And so, um, you know, Prof, Prof Grabodi, for example, when she blasts these little uh, uh, nano nanoparticles with with a microscope, a microscope objective is pretty famous for having the shortest focal length that you can possibly get. And oftentimes, when you're using a microscope, the focal length is so short that it's really hard to keep the keep the lens from from touching your sample. It's, it's sort of designed to have as short a focal length as possible. And uh, one of the ways of seeing that is for, for her, she's actually doing this. She's actually shining a laser through her microscope system and trying to make the smallest spot size possible. And so having a microscope objective with a really short focal length, as you make this focal length shorter and shorter and shorter, you can make the, the beam tighter and tighter and tighter in focus. And this this is the this is that that relation. Um, I think I think I will actually pause there and give you a little little break because next time we're going to start talking about actual cavities and boundary conditions and that's kind of a whole whole different can of worms and I'd rather not start that topic a little bit early. So um, I'm happy to either answer questions about this or answer questions about the the homework or the lab exercises that are due at the end of this week, um, or, uh, or if people want to go and take a little break before their next thing, they're, they're welcome to do that too. So I guess I'll, I'll uh, stop to, well, does anybody have any questions about this before I stop the recording? Maybe questions about homework or lab stuff can, can be off the, off the recording. <laughs>